All righty, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you are doing well. I have the man with the best drum set on Wall Street, Tyler <laughs> Woods here. Tyler, how are you? How are things over at the CMT? And how are you surviving in this um, unique, at least we have a roadmap now type of yeah. market? Yeah, uh, things are going very well, Creed. It's great to see you. And, uh, you know, it's nice to see that fall and winter are, uh, are showing signs, at least in, uh, in Montana, uh, here on the East Coast. We're getting a lot of rain and, uh, you know, markets are feeling pretty heavy. Hopefully people aren't uh, down in the doldrums. Uh, this is this is the creative part of creative destruction, right? Some of the big weeds <laughs> have to fall before uh, new flowers can grow. And uh, that's a tough market to trade through. It is. It is. And it, it speaks highly to, uh, well, I hate to say it to the gurus and stuff out there that, you know, everybody's right in a bull market. But yeah. I think when someone has been through the sequences of the markets and understanding how that nature is, bear market, bull market, stagnation market, and the yeah. shifts of political spheres as well, uh, that really hones a trader to be able to work in multiple things. Uh, mm -hmm. We got the TNX up here on the 10 year and we yep. just saw as well for standard mortgage rates going up to 6.39%. I mean, yep. it, it's, it's very interesting overall. We're, we're seeing numbers change, but from everybody I know in the professional field, many of them are still sitting in cash, at least 70% cash, which at yep. this time and year is pretty outlandish from what we've seen before. What are your thoughts? Well, uh, the way that I was taught technical analysis at the CMT Association uh, over the last decade has been to take a top-down approach, right? So what we're seeing happen in, in the large equity indices is often driven by some intermarket relationships. So folks like John Murphy, who's a CMT charter holder and uh, wrote the book on intermarket analysis, started to uh, encourage all investors. So even if you're not a rates trader, you don't, uh, you don't trade in futures and commodities, there's a lot of information in those markets. So yeah, I pulled up a quarterly chart of the TNX, the 10 year treasury yield, because you know here's where I was born in 1981 and we have been in a 40 year bull market, right? Rates moving inversely uh, to bond prices. So we've seen this, this 40 year downtrend in, uh, in US treasury rates. And since the COVID collapse, what has mainly just been mean reversion to that long-term trend line is finally showing signs of breaking to the upside. Obviously, yesterday's uh, announcement by Jerome Powell and the Fed that they're hiking another 75 basis points. Uh, my assumption, if I'm allowed to make those, was that everybody kind of knew that that was going to happen, right? The Fed has to raise rates above the rate of inflation in order to stem the tide of inflation. But I, I feel like a lot of investors are still being caught off guard and expected uh, there to be less of a hike or not to see another hike. They're, they're looking for dovish commentary by the Fed. And I'm not in the business of, uh, you know, natural language processing and dissecting exactly what words they said and when they make the announcements. Instead, I like to look at what the markets are doing and just try to react responsibly. So we are clearly above the long-term downtrend line in interest rates. Uh, we saw, you know, further rate hike yesterday. And if we just dive down into a daily period, what we're seeing on that trend for, uh, for US Treasury rates is just up, up and away. Um, and so I'm looking at right now uh, something called go, no, go charts. Uh, a friend of mine for the last decade or more, uh, Alex Cole, created these tools. Uh, and I actually get to get to work with him as the co-founder of this company in addition to my role at the CMT Association. But the idea here is that we want all of the information that technical analysis can provide us to understand trend direction and the veracity of those moves, right? Uh, so if you think about things like multiple moving averages or Bollinger Bands uh, for, for a volatility measure, or you could look at Donchian channels, which the, the turtle traders made very famous uh, with Richard Dennis back in the day. All of those signals are really helpful. But the problem with technical analysis and for a lot of traders is that uh, they go on this search for the holy grail and they start throwing study after study after study after study all over their charts. And what happens is you lose sight of the most important indicator we have of all, which is price. 
Price is what pays. Price is what we got to keep our eye on. That's how we're going to spot important uh, support and resistance levels. That's how we're going to see uh, some of the patterns that Edwards and McGee were, were writing about in the 30s and 40s. And so when I look at this chart uh, where we see blue bars, that's the strongest form of bullish trend conditions. All of the composite blend of indicators are telling us this is moving to the upside and it's moving quickly. Uh, we've built some sensitivity into the model. So light green is the weaker form of a go trend. And that whole name, go or no go, is, is borrowed from a NASA pass-fail test sy system. If you wanted to launch billions of dollars of uh, rocket ship into, uh, into orbit, you want to make sure that the conditions for your launch day are really in your favor. And that's the idea behind trend following is that you have a technical checklist and when all of those conditions are met, you place the trade with all of those probabilities on your side. So we had a, a, a bit of a cooling off period in interest rates. Again, now we're looking at the daily chart. Uh, so in August, we saw that pull back. There was some bond buying activity. That's great. But uh, what we have seen here in September so far in these last three weeks is further move to the upside and it's confirmed by this go-no-go -go oscillator. It's a, another blend of momentum inputs. Uh, there's a lot of great momentum tools and oscillators out there that many folks have panel after panel after panel <laughs> below their, uh, their prices on their charts. And we, we blended all of those into one so that we could get a, a cleaner view on what's happening in the marketplace. So that's, so that, that's the view on, uh, on interest rates. That brings a, a question overall. Uh, so for those that have tuned in and seen my charts as well, uh, I use the old trade the market squeeze, Keltner Channel, Bollinger Band, et cetera. Sure. And I, I've always tried to get people to think of the idea of we're, we are trading price, yes, at the end of the day. And we're looking for a transaction zone, transaction up or above, looking at those zones overall. Is yeah. it fair to say that within the current markets, because of the ease of access that people have, that our markets are much more sensitive to investor sentiment than we used to see the 80s, the 90s, because beforehand, if someone wanted to move their 401k money around or something like that, they had to call a guy, he had to do a thing, etc. But now they just yeah. log on to Vanguard, they log on to XYZ. Yeah, so yeah. I try to get people to understand that using, using tools like the go or no go, using tools like the TTM, but understanding the sentiment behind it and that we're not just trading price, but we're also trading people. Do you, mm -hmm. do you believe understanding the psychology of the people in the markets, especially bond markets, interest markets right now, mm -hmm. uh, is key or am I off tilt with that? You are spot on, Creed. Uh, the, the, the future of technical analysis is really that connection between behavioral economics, behavioral finance. We've seen a lot of Nobel prizes handed out to uh, cognitive psychologists that understand human emotions. Now, technicians have been doing this uh, for hundreds of years. If we go back to Charles Dow in the late 19th century, uh, but we can even go back further to people like Monet Sahoma, uh, who, who was trading in the rice pits of Osaka, Japan, and came up with created this data visualization tool that we call candlestick charting today. Mm -hmm. The whole idea is that it's not a slot machine. This is not a mathematical equation to solve. Instead, it's much more of a poker game. And you have to understand who the other investors are that you're, that you're trading against. So you asked a, uh, made a great point about market structure. Certainly, we saw that move to decimalization, the move to online low fee brokerages, uh, creating a frictionless environment for trading. But then we've also seen some market structure changes just since COVID, where 100 million Americans were sent home uh, from factories and jobs, and they were given a stimulus check. And we've got, you know, uh, uh, folks like Robinhood who've created a place for new traders to enter the markets. And when I say there's a market structural change, what I'm what I'm talking about there is that we saw a very narrow market. So if you look at things like market breadth uh, through 2021, that leadership of a, a rising index in the S&P 500 or NASDAQ was really driven by a very few names. Uh, all of those new traders were very concerned about Tesla options, Facebook, Netflix, Google, uh, Amazon, and that's about it. They weren't trading a broad basket of securities. They were trading the names that they knew and loved and the things that worked during that stay at home trade, the, the closed economy. 
Now, what we're seeing is an unwind of a lot of those long duration tech stocks. And, uh, and what we're seeing at the index level is just further moves to the downside. So this is the S&P 500 on a daily chart going back to the start of 2022. And uh, I've had a lot of really great conversations with uh, portfolio managers and analysts talking about how seductive relief rallies can be, right? Yes. So the, the responsible analyst is going to look at multiple timeframes. This goes back to Charles Dow uh, in the 1890s talking about how the markets move over multiple timeframes. And we have to keep an eye on the primary trend. So these relief rallies, we, we got into go trends. But if we take a look at the, the weekly chart of the S&P and we look at how messy that has been since the start of the year, we're, we're in a downtrend. It confirmed series of lower highs and lower lows. Uh, we never got back to the bullish trend configuration on a weekly basis. So if we're thinking about our primary trend, it's to the downside. And what, what we know about relief rallies is that it's kind of like the... Uh, uh, to borrow a phrase from my, my friend and uh, colleague Dave Lundgren, uh, co-host of the Fill the Gap podcast, he said, relief rallies are like um, uh, the good cop, bad cop routine, right? So yeah. we're in a bear market since the, uh, since the start of the year. We're in a downtrend. But occasionally we're getting these relief rallies that are highly volatile, but they're short-lived. And people get so excited about any move to the upside that hopefully that pain is going away. And they're anchoring to this recency bias of, Oh, well, the tech stocks, that's what carried me through 2020 and 2021. So that's, that's where I'm putting money to work again. And we have seen some relative strength in sectors like the XLK, the information technology sector. But these relief rallies are very short lived. And we've got a lot of overhead pressure uh, from that macro picture of things like the interest rates and, uh, and obviously strengthen the US dollar. Uh, and I think that's where we, that's where we started this, uh, uh, this chat was just pull up the US dollar index. Uh, let me use an ETF for ease of uh, ease of view. There's the US dollar up, up and away. And all of these moments are, are by the dip uh, on, on just holding cash, right? Which is crazy in an inflationary environment that the US dollar is so strong. But if you look at the rest of the world, uh, we might be the, the only alternative, at least in a, in a store of value uh, from fiat currencies. Okay, so that's going to bring in, I'm going to throw a monkey into that wrench, crypto, it. when it comes to it. So I actually heard the statement the other day for second world, third world countries on that, um, mm -hmm. El Salvador, Venezuela, et cetera, uh, their currency has, it's gone to heck in a handbasket yep. overall. There's no stability within it. Now, mm -hmm. typically reserve currencies only last for roughly 100 years, give or take. Mm -hmm. uh, I agree. The central bank's going to be around for a very long time. The dollar's going to be around for a very long time. But when we get to the sentiment of people willing to do transactions, mm -hmm. we've, we've already seen for a fact that some people are trying to price oil in other things besides the USD. The idea mm -hmm. is out there. The seed's been planted. Mm -hmm. Is it outlandish to say that in a far future, I'm not talking five years or 10 years, but we could actually see oil or similar resources based in, in BTC, based in ETH, because it's mm -hmm. what was described to me overall is BTC itself, the way we gain, we gain value in that is we're able to convert cheap energy mm. and sell it in more mm. expensive markets. Mm. Well, what is oil? What is what is that gas? It is nothing but energy. So yeah. if it was priced in something that is, quite frankly, you have to use that oil and that nat gas to create said product, you yeah. have that whole flow. Yeah. Uh, a correlation of this would be the price of cotton to the price it actually costs to print a dollar. Yeah. So that kind of correlation. Now, I know that that's out there a yeah. little bit, but do you think in... 10, 15 years, we may could actually see a different form for basing oil and other energy resources off of? I mean, I think we, we saw some really interesting geopolitical tensions. Interesting is a terrible word, uh, but <laughs> Russia insisting that oil be purchased in rubles, right? Uh, yeah. That they're selling, selling that gas to Europe, uh, but needing to be paid in rubles. Um, I, I think that uh, for any analyst out there that's aware of their currency risk, uh, you you got to look at things denominated in lots of different currencies, uh, certainly your own home country. 
And you brought up uh, a number of economies that, that have faced runaway inflation, El Salvador, Venezuela. Um, there was a time I was in Ghana in, uh, well, this was decades ago, um, where it was, it was 17,000 CDs to go buy a loaf of bread. The, the, the currency was not pegged to the US dollar. Uh, CDs, uh, CIDI, were, was the local currency in Ghana. And so you see people walking around a crowd with suitcases of cash to go to the grocery store and buy some plantains and bread. That happens, and it's happened throughout history when uh, when central governments let inflation get out of control. And I think there's a lot of uh, maybe worthwhile criticism, or at least it's a, it's a defensible argument, criticism of our central bank for being so late to move to fight inflation, uh, which is why we're experiencing this eight and a half, nine percent uh, that we're dealing with right now. So. Do, do I see a future where these resources are denominated in cryptocurrencies? Sure, I'm open-minded to any possibility. I think the, uh, the strain there is on the volatility of those moves uh, within cryptocurrencies. So broad-based adoption makes sense in countries like Venezuela and, and El Salvador, where you've got this runaway inflation already in your fiat currency and your reserve currency. So for them, the you know the bet to move to a crypto uh, makes perfect sense. It's good for their country to do something like that. Uh, for the U.S., we're not there yet, uh, but I I would keep a mind open to uh, to any and all outcomes. Uh, that's I, that's the beauty of investing. I like that. So we we had talked beforehand, and for for those that are not up to speed on what we've been discussing, uh, you were mentioning that. Uh, we have a uh, event coming up with the CMT. Uh, would you like to talk on that a little bit? For sure. So my role at the CMT Association is many fold. We're a small organization, so I get to wear lots of hats. Uh, but one of the things that we do, and one of the, the real funding, founding principles for our organization over 50 years ago on Wall Street, was that markets are a incredibly complex environment and trading is a pretty lonely profession. It's a pretty lonely pursuit uh, if you are always alone with the market. So having a place to engage in collegial discourse, to talk with others and about new ideas, about what's working or what's not working in any given market environment, uh, that's really core to what our organization was built off. And that's why we've got uh, tens of thousands of members all over the world uh, who come together on a regular basis uh, to talk about what's going on. So the first one that I wanted to highlight uh, for everybody who's listening uh, on the Eastern side of the planet, uh, we'll be hosting an Asia Pacific Regional Summit uh, on November 5th. And that's gonna take place in Mumbai, India, but we're also going to have a simulcast of the entire event. So if you're in uh, anywhere from uh, Dubai to, uh, to Seoul, uh, we'd, we'd love for you to, to tune into that. Uh, and you can find out a whole lot more information right at cmtassociation.org. That's our Asia Pacific Summit happening on November 5th. Uh, we've got uh, many hundreds of folks who are gonna join us in Mumbai, 30 speakers coming from all over the planet. Uh, the last time we got to do this in person was actually 2019, the fall of 2019. Uh, so we're bringing it back in real life in three dimensions uh, for the first time since COVID. Uh, but that was just an incredible uh, chance to bring folks like Martin Pring, uh, Julius de Kempener and, and many others to India uh, for an audience that, uh, that covered the entire region. This year we'll, we'll have some folks coming in from Hong Kong as speakers, uh, also from Japan and from Dubai. Um, as well as many others from uh, from the United States. Uh, there's my good friend, Ralph Akampura, who, who was able to come over and join us last time. So uh, definitely check that out. Uh, a little closer to home for me, uh, we'll also be hosting a seminar in Toronto. Uh, got a, an exciting new, kick, kicking off an exciting new series of meetings for Canadian investment professionals. Uh, we'll be in Toronto on October 6th, right downtown on King Street at the Ivy Center. Uh, we'll just do a, a one day seminar, two to 7 p.m., have some drinks, do some networking. Um, but I'm really excited to have folks like Brendan Besnicki from Auspice Capital. It's a huge uh, managed futures uh, CTA in Canada. Uh, so we'll talk a lot about trend following with he and Dave Lundgren. Uh, Larry Berman, who's the voice of technicals in, uh, in Canada, but really a value minded investor. So for those of you who are really fundamentally driven in your approach, 
um, not just buying momentum strength, but thinking about mean reversion tactics, um, technical analysis can offer a whole lot for you. Uh, and we'll talk about relative strength and we'll, we'll look at current markets uh, with some great sell side analysts, Azan Habib and uh, Javed Mirza as well. So that's coming up October 6th in Toronto uh, at the Ivy Center. Uh, so make sure to come out and check that out. Man, that is going to be jam packed. And for those unaware, please go back and look at this video and do a quick Google on something because that, that that's actually a powerhouse yeah. of people. This is a good way to kick things. I, I might have to make a flight to India. Not going to lie. Uh, that's it's going to uh, be amazing. I promise it'll oh, be, uh, it'll be worth all those hours and that jet lag getting off. The plane. Oh, that that's a, for those unaware to have that many professionals of that level in mm -hmm. one room, if you even get 15 minutes to pick their mind on it, yeah, do it. It 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 is worth four years in in a college, is what I'm saying. <laughs> oh, that is good. Uh, yeah. All righty, Tyler. I want to be respectful of your time overall. And on our next discussion later on, I'd actually like to talk with you on the go no go charting system next time. But for people going into the weekend, what's your piece of dad advice for them to how they can help advance themselves to not only become a better market technician, but to become better in understanding the new market sentiment structure that we have going in. You got any advice for them? I would say, uh, you know, the, the most important lesson for me it, uh, in the first few months that I joined the CMT Association was, was actually understanding the indicators that you're using on your charts. Uh, and some of that just requires good old fashioned hard work. Uh, so yeah. if you need a resource or a guide, the CMT level one curriculum covers a very broad uh, area of subject matter, chart construction, lots of different indicators, just to give you a basic understanding of what it is that you're looking at and what those creators and inventors were actually trying to measure when they created these things. I mean, Wells Wilder in the 1970s created the RSI because the US markets were range bound. And so this idea of overbought and oversold and looking at an RSI for, for signals to uh, look for mean reversion, that's the basis of that tool. Can you use it in a trending environment? Of course, uh, and it can be very powerful, but you have to understand the context of the market environment you're in. So I would encourage everybody not to overcomplicate their charts, uh, to do their homework and understand what those indicators are. And, and CMT Association is a great resource uh, for learning a lot more about the technical toolkit. Absolutely. I love it. All right, Tyler, thank you for dropping some very, very strong knowledge today. We look hey, forward to uh, chatting with you next time on that yeah. one. And uh, if I can make it, uh, I'm going to go sign up for the Mumbai one. I, I'm I'm seriously considering now that I've seen the full powerhouse through there, we, we may be seeing each other there. So I love it. That but would be awesome. I look forward to it. Stay warm, my friend. And I will talk to you soon. Sounds great. Thanks so much.